We all know what the stasis of policy is, uh, even if we haven't used that word for it before. Uh, we're very familiar with people telling us what to do. People talking about the way the world ought to be, uh, somebody ought to pass a law, somebody shouldn't drive like that. And you know, if you want to do the, the right thing, you need to do what I would do in that same situation. We've got plenty of people talking to us like that our whole lives. Uh, we talk to other people like that. That sometimes becomes our default mode. But we don't typically think of this as a conclusion in an argument. We might go on and give what seems like a reason, but we typically don't think of it as something that has a structure. And so frequently, uh, the most common thesis statement in every uh, composition class I've ever taught over the last 15 years has been some sort of policy statement. Somebody wants to say, here's the way things should be, whether it's a law that should be passed or the way people should do things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to be very careful how many of those you are gonna put in one essay. Really, with a few exceptions, it's the best sort of principle, the best heuristic to follow is pick one policy statement, one should statement that you're gonna then spend the rest of your essay trying to develop, specify, anchor in reality, explaining cause and effect relationships, how doing this thing will lead to this result, why this thing is better than the, the other alternatives, and defining your terms very specifically and grounding everything in facts. Because otherwise, the, the tendency might be to just give one policy claim after another policy claim after another policy claim after another policy claim. So if I said, uh, people should eat more vegetables and eat fewer simple carbohydrates. Oh, they should also go exercise more. They should also do things outdoors more often. And they should also take vitamin supplements. And they should also, all of these are separate claims and they might seem to fit together under a general topic like health, but each one of them is a separate policy claim and each one of them depends on a whole list of premises and a lot of unspoken warrants that you're not gonna have time to enunciate, to articulate, and to back up with supportable evidence in a four to five page paper. So pick one policy argument and then think of everything else as structure. Because if you have a policy argument that doesn't have a, a structure of other stasis warrants underneath it, then all you really have is a should statement, a claim without a, a good argument. And if someone already agrees with that claim, that's fine, they're, they're gonna buy into it, but not because of anything you've said. But if they don't already, if they don't share all your warrants, if they don't share the same values and the same beliefs about cause and effect and the same definitions, and they don't know the same facts, then everything that you want to get across is just gonna fall apart. So we don't have to go in this order in your paper, but you have to have your reader to the point where they will agree or at least give assent to all of these things before you can really get them to adhere to your uh, policy claim. And that doesn't mean you can't put a policy claim first, but before your reader's going to really give assent to that policy claim, they have to acknowledge that the facts that you're using in supporting your case are real facts. You get them from peer reviewed sources or you can at least cite a source that will allow your reader to verify those facts independently. You have to use the same definitions and those definitions have to have the same not only denotation, you know, not, not only the specific definition but also the connotation. If there's value judgments connected to them, then if your reader doesn't share those, then your argument's not gonna work. If your reader isn't focusing on the particular facts, if they're not uh, using the same concepts, then your argument's not gonna work. So you, you have to enunciate the important definitions, the ones where people might not uh, be in sync. If, if there's any chance somebody is, is reading a word that you've written and depending on a different definition or a different concept, then you have to explicitly define those terms and define that focus. You've gotta be able to prove cause and effect. If you wanna say somebody should do something, then presumably that's because it's going to lead to a, a commonly beneficial result, a result we both want. But they may not believe that that action will lead to that result. So you have to show good reason, you have to make an argument why one thing will lead to another. And that might be a sufficient cause, but it's more likely going to be uh, a necessary cause that might be remote, that's gonna, that's gonna take some evidence, it's gonna take some uh, support. But that's all gonna be a moot point if you don't have the same key value assumptions, uh, the warrants that lead you to prefer one outcome to another.
and certain people might share all the same uh, foundations of value. They might have a sort of deontological thinking, uh, but you might need to move them to a more utilitarian thinking in order to get them to think about helping people that are further away or avoiding harm that is not immediately obvious. If you want to get them to validate warrants about uh, authority and loyalty and purity, you've gotta really make that case because that's those are the kinds of uh, foundations of morality that not everybody holds in the same esteem as they hold things like doing no harm and being fair. And only once all of that structure is in place does the whole thing start to work, start to flow. Then all of those other points of stasis will flow into your policy claim, so much so that you won't really have to spend too much time saying more about the policy. As long as it's specific and they know what they can do, once you've got a scent on all of these other points of stasis, then the policy will become self-evident. But it's only then that you can argue for a type of policy that might be as simple as saying people should eat more of this kind of food and less of that kind of food, or do something individually. Or it could be something as large as arguing for a bill that would hopefully become a law something that would shape not only an individual action, but would actually shape uh, the actions of lots and lots of people over a long period of time, that sort of level of policy. But once you're finally to that point, once you have all the other groundwork covered, you need to know exactly what you want, what sort of action you want to uh, advocate. So a policy argument, sometimes called a proposal, the stasis of proposal, uh, this is a proposal for action or maybe inaction. Maybe you're telling people to not do something or stop doing something. But it's aimed at either getting something done or preventing something from being done. And the necessary components for that are there has to be a need or a problem that needs to be solved. Because if, if everything's being done the best way, you don't need to tell people to do what they're already doing. But if there's a problem or maybe it's a problem that hasn't been acknowledged, you have to show that there's a problem. Uh, you have to uh, show that uh, this particular policy, this particular action that I'm proposing will solve that problem. But to do that, I have to examine questions of definition and value. I have to use facts to prove that the problem is real. Then I'm gonna recommend a specific action, not just somebody ought to do something, not something vague like that. Not people should show more responsibility or people should care more about other people. Uh, those are not specific actions. I need a specific action. And then I have to show that that action is feasible, that it can be done. Uh, this is why I don't usually recommend that uh, students in a, a first year composition class write about what the government ought to do, what laws ought to be passed, because there's not a lot you can do at this level that's actually gonna change the, the lawmaking process. Uh, but there is the p possibility of uh, advocating a, a way of thinking about uh, a particular uh, law that might spread to other people and those people might spread it and it could eventually um, help clarify the way we look at a particular decision process at the state or even national level. But there's whatever the action you're advocating, it needs to be something that is something we could possibly accomplish. It's an action that is possible, practical, and proportional to the problem. And it's gonna require us to examine questions of cause and effect and anchor our decision process in the facts. There's no use in trying to respond to something that may or may not be real. And there are always gonna be alternative policies. We might say that somebody should do something, but if you're gonna argue for a specific action, there may be other specific actions that might be better. So you have to evaluate those. You have to assign value uh, and say why this action is gonna reach a better outcome, a more valuable outcome than the others. And to understand, especially the part about what's feasible and what's relevant and what's actually a problem, you have to know who your audience is. You have to know what situation you're addressing. The professor of rhetoric, Lloyd Bitzer, drawing on Aristotle and Aristotelian rhetoric, advocates that we consider, when we consider rhetoric, we consider the rhetorical situation, the specific real world situation that our rhetoric is addressing. Is there a real world problem? Who does that problem affect? Who can do something about it? Do they need to do something about it now? Is it important or can it wait? And what are the constraints on doing something about that? And that's why he identifies these three components to the rhetorical situation. The first is exigence. Uh, this is the problem or the relevance of what you're advocating. Uh, the exigence is an imperfection marked by urgency, is a defect, an obstacle, something waiting to be done, a thing which is other than it should be. And 
you're communicating to a particular audience, and an audience isn't just whoever listens to you or whoever reads your essay. I am not your audience as your professor unless you're talking about the way things uh, should be done in a classroom. Think of your reader as somebody, uh, as a person who is capable of being influenced by this discourse and of being a mediator for change. Now, this is especially true with policy. Is your, your reader somebody who can actually do something, who can actually do the thing that you're advocating? But this is something you also want to think about even if you're just uh, discussing an issue of cause and effect. You're just trying to show that one thing does cause the other or that one thing is more valuable uh, than the other. Or you're just trying to say that in this situation we should define terms more. But your audience is only the people who were able to follow through with that advice, to do something with it. It's not just anybody who will listen or anybody who will read. But then to do something about what you're talking about, to act on this issue, there are gonna be constraints. We can't just do whatever we want. We can't just say everybody ought to move mountains in order to make this thing happen. Uh, we can't move mountains. We have constraints on what we're able to do as individuals. What are those constraints in this issue? And the constraints are, as he says, made up of persons, events, objects, and relationships, which are part of the situation because they have the power to constrain decision and action needed to modify the exigence. So some of the, the constraints are gonna be on the action we're capable of achieving. There are also gonna be constraints that we're gonna get to when we talk about the backfire effect and the Rogerian argument. Constraints on whether or not people are going to really listen to our arguments, give us a, a fair and objective, open-minded hearing. Uh, those constraints are there as well, and it, depending on who your audience is, those constraints may be loose and those constraints may be tight. But you have to know what those constraints are, and to know that you have to know who your audience is, and to know who your audience is, you have to know why the issue is a problem, what the problem is that you're addressing. So let's take a look at one last example that puts together all of the different types of stasis and, and builds up that pyramid to uh, a really solid but very nuanced and very uh, specific policy claim. This is an article from the conversation.com, which is a good source for uh, very well thought out uh, arguments and thought provoking arguments that uh, look at the subtleties involved rather than trying to oversimplify things. And in this case, uh, this is an article about a familiar problem, and that is uh, how much screen time should children be allowed to have? Uh, time on their phones, on video games, uh, watching television, and things like that. But even though this is a commonly discussed issue, this is not a, a common example of the type of argument where we would normally expect. Uh, and these are quotations, selections from the larger article. But the article starts out by saying, one of the most frustrating issues modern parents face is how to manage children's screen time. It then makes reference to a familiar heuristic that children should be limited to two hours a day of screen time. And shows that, well, most children get a lot more than that. A recent online poll of 18,000 children by ABC Children's Program Behind the News found that 56% of respondents exceed that two hour daily limit. A survey of 2,620 Australian children, and this article was written uh, in Australia, uh, but a survey of uh, 2,620 Australian children aged eight to 16 years had similar results. The study showed that 45% of eight year olds to 80% of 16 year olds exceed that recommended uh, less than two hours uh, per day limit. Now this is doing two things, it's defining the problem, it's showing that uh, there is a, an exceeding of a limit that we've already established, and it gives factual data, it lays the groundwork for the, the foundation of the rest of this argument by giving specific numbers that show us that uh, we're not just uh, extrapolating from uh, a too small of a data set. Uh, this isn't just some parent uh, talking about their own children's use of screen time and generalizing from that. They have specific data that you yourself can track down. And this article acknowledges the usual definition of the problem. It says that compulsive or nonstop checking of text, emails, news feeds, websites, or other apps can interfere with anyone's daily life, work, and relationships. Uh, this isn't a claim that's going to be necessary to the ultimate conclusion. This isn't a premise that's going to be necessary to the ultimate conclusion of this article, but it is a common premise that people bring to this conversation. And this article is acknowledging that that premise in general can be true. So it's uh, the recognition of potential causal connections, and it foresees the possible counterargument by acknowledging the possibility of a problem under certain criteria. If the behavior is compulsive, then it can interfere. These are qualified terms. They're not very specific. But the author is going to contest 
the generalization that uh, children are always getting too much uh, screen time by saying that the guidelines we use to benchmark how long children should spend on a screen are out of date. They were actually developed years before tablets and the many devices we use today were even invented. The screen time guidelines we currently use were developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics in the 1990s to direct children's television viewing. In particular, they were a response to kids watching violent uh, television content. So what's happening now is rather than going to the usual policy from the, rather than starting with that usual assumption about cause and effect that children get too much screen time and it's having these negative effects, it's actually backing up to the level of definition and saying, hey, wait a second, our definitions might be inappropriate to the current reality where screen time now doesn't just mean watching television, it also means using phones, using tablets, using playing video games, uh, but also presumably things like this, taking an online course. So here's some more redefinition. There's consumption, there's creation, and there's communication. So notice, these are three different types of screen time. Uh, you consume, like uh, entertainment uh, through the screen, then there's creation. This is something you could not do on a television. You couldn't create your own work of art. You couldn't create your own essay. And then there's communication. Uh, communication, in fact, is the exact thing that people complain television interfered with. Uh, you couldn't communicate through a television because the, the information only comes one way. But with, uh, if you're on Skype or if you're text messaging somebody, you are communicating. So this is examining and redefining the concepts that we use to apply to interpret the facts. The author continues by saying, there's a big difference between endless hours of watching YouTube videos of Chocolate Sweets being unboxed, this is presumably consumption, uh, or just entertainment value, to video chatting with a parent who is away from home. This is communication. A better alternative is to determine children's screen use based on the quality of the activity and the level of stimulation children are getting. Okay, so we now move to the judgment about quality or value. Once we redefine what screen time is, we now have more than one value judgment associated with the word screen time. Uh, some of that value judgment will still be negative, it's just you know passive consumption, but some of it will be positive, it's communication, it's creation. So that means when we come back to this uh, value premise to re-examine it, we have to bring these new definitions to do that. And our value judgment is gonna be a little bit more subtle. And that finally leads to the policy claim, which is not the usual one you hear associated with screen time limitation. We should still keep an eye out for excessive time online. Uh, that word should is the indicator this is a policy claim. If a child is spending most of their day and night on screen, then that needs reassessment and management. So again, saying that needs uh, an action is, is a policy claim. But it's not the only policy claim, it's not the only possible policy claim. Uh, and this author isn't going to stop there and say, well, managing your children's screen time is all you need to do. Uh, that is the, the usual response. But this author is going to give a more subtle response uh, that's not exactly a contradiction of that policy claim, but it's uh, a more refined uh, plan of action. But the ultimate message is that whatever resource we use to manage children's screen usage, they ultimately need to learn to manage it themselves. We must introduce them to the concept of mindful usage. As children get older and accumulate more and more devices and greater need to use technology, Helping them recognize the importance of balance becomes an important basic life skill. So once again, uh, more things are changing, not only uh, defining what we mean by screen time, but also the necessity, the value of some of that screen time. Uh, we have to learn to, to use the computer more often. It's part of our modern world. Uh, there is a, a causal necessity. Uh, using electronic devices is almost now mandatory for functioning in the modern world. So we can't just limit ourselves to two hours of use of any type of screen. That's just no longer practicality, and it's not even necessarily something we want. And once we realize that, we realize that there is a different policy judgment available to us, and that is not just limiting it, not making this an external imposition of authority, but actually teaching children to be competent in deciding how much is too much, and how to decide what type of screen time is good and what type of screen time is not so good.
So what this author does is take the same bedrock of facts, and that is 56% uh, of the children are getting more than two hours uh, a day, they're exceeding that two hour limit. 45% of eight year olds, 80% of 16 year olds exceed that two hour limit. The facts haven't changed, but what we do with those facts depends on the definitions. The old definition that people are still using is that uh, screen time is just TV viewing, uh, and TV viewing is one, is unidirectional, it's just one way, and it's passive entertainment. But that's the 1990s definition. If we move to the 2010s and 2020 definition, that screen time is social interaction, and it's education, but it's also passive entertainment. It can be any of those, consumption, creation, or communication. And with that definition, that leads us to look at new causal parameters, like the old cause and effect relationship was that TV time leads to attention deficit and antisocial behavior. And that was, and that's a bad thing, or at least it was. Those negative outcomes uh, counterbalanced any value that the entertainment value of, of TV possessed. And so that led to the policy of adopting a two hour limit for children. But now, that cause and effect relationship is different. Now that we look at the, we define our concept of screen time differently, we see different cause and effect relationships at work. So limited screen time actually limits the ability to socialize with other people. It limits your ability to use educational material. It limits your time that you can use uh, the, the computer or the phone as a tool to create something. Uh, but it also in limits your passive entertainment time. And what we do with those different cause and effect relationships depends on how we value their outcomes. And uh, the entertainment may not be that important, but we do have uh, a high value placed on socializing and education and creation. So because those things are still important, we still want to use the device that has the screen for those purposes, um, but we want to limit our passive consumption. So that means not just restricting screen time, this leads us to a new policy judgment which is teaching mindful usage of any device with a screen. So what the author has done is not just compared to final policies, but actually gone all the way back to the level of the definition and reassess the definitions, reassess the causes, reassess the values. And those are the things, every one of those points of stasis uh, that's part of those two sort of, those two pyramids that are built on the same bedrock of facts, uh, the entire thing, the definitions are weighed against the definitions, the causal relationships are weighed against the causal relationships, the value judgments are weighed against the other value judgments, and only once all those are, are weighed do we see that uh, here's why one policy is better than another. So this isn't just the weighing of conclusions, it's the weighing of entire arguments with all of their premises and all of their warrants connected to that final policy decision. And this weighing of options is our uh, definition of, of what an essay is. Uh, remember all the way back to when we talked about the defining what an essay was. It's not just a piece of writing. Uh, it's not just a string of opinions, a string of uh, conclusions that are uh, not supported by uh, reasons and evidence. Uh, the word comes from the action of weighing gold against uh, a material that may or may not be gold, uh, to see if, if this new material is actually gold, and if it's diluted with some other metal, some cheaper metal, then what's actually gold will be heavier. This led to the use of the word essay as a trial, a test, or a proof, or an experiment. And from there, it moves on to that same sort of uh, comparison, trial, testing one argument against another, uh, that we do on paper, or in this case, uh, digitally on a screen uh, in writing an essay. And with that, hopefully you're ready to make whatever policy argument you wanna make uh, now that you realize what components are necessary to warrant that conclusion, to earn that conclusion, and to achieve assent from people who may reach a different conclusion, but because of uh, a difference in a value or a different assumption about cause and effect, uh, using different definitions, different concepts, or not being aware of all the facts. Now, once you bring your reader to an understanding of all these other components, uh, you almost don't have to make that policy claim too overtly. The, the reader, by the time they uh, have that foundation in front of them, uh, they're gonna follow you right to that uh, policy judgment. Or at least, you're gonna be a little bit closer to that than you would have been otherwise.